My name is Ozella Brundage and I'm a PhD student at Walden University and my concentration is on early childhood education and how the brain learns to read from a neurological perspective. Now this pres presentation is a partial requirement for the Knowledge Area Module 5, and this is the application section. Now, the name of the section is Language Acquisition from a Neurological Perspective. Now, we're going to look at part one of this series in part one, we want to look at the classical neuroscientists who came up with these theories through aphasia studies. We also want to look at the basic information or the structure of the brain. Now, first we'll see that the theory that we are setting our neuroscience foundation on is the Warnick, Lechtham, and Gershwin's theory. And they did classical aphasia studies. Now, I will also include Paul Pierre Bracca, because Paul uh, Bracca, he did work in 1861, and he located the area of the brain that was responsible for articulation. And, uh, but in 1874, Carl Warnick, he located the area of the brain that was responsible for language uh, comprehension. And yet, a, a decade later, we have uh, Ludwig Lechtham, who did work and he located uh, anatomical areas in the brain that were actually associated with language learning. Nearly a decade, well, a century later, we have uh, Norman Jeshwin. He revived the language comprehension theory and also Lechwin's anatomical structures. And he located these structures and named them. They're called the angular gyrus, which is responsible for spatial language learning. And then there's the supermarginal gyrus, responsible for phonological processing. He also, and other researchers located the occipital temporal area, which was found to be associated with grapheme, phoneme, phonological processing, and also the auditory area of the brain. Now, we need to look at the basic structure of the brain uh, before we proceed on. And we know that the brain is made up of two hemispheres. We have the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And these hemispheres are homologous. And what we mean by homologous is that whatever's on the left side of the hemisphere is also found on the right side of the, hemis uh, on the brain. And um, we look at the gross anatomy of the brain. We can see that that's the gray matter and the gray matter as the neural tissue, excuse me. And then there's a material called the white matter. And the white matter are connective tissues. And what I'd like to show you here on this slide is we have one of the large connective tissues that connect the left and the right hemispheres. Now, I'd like to um, go over and show you the primary areas of the language areas of the brain. We have the Broca's area, and Broca is located in the inferior frontal gyrus, and also we have the Warnix area, and the Warnix area is located in the superior temporal gyrus in the posterior area towards the back. And um, we have the supramarginal gyrus in the parietal uh, lobe, and also the, uh, um, the angular gyrus, which is located in the parietal lobe as well. Now, due to uh, imaging, neural imaging, 
um, studies in, uh, I would say, research, we found that there are additional areas that are very important to language acquisition. Now, we have, uh, first I will talk about the planum temporal. Now, the planum temporal is located inside of the warnix area. We said that the warnix area is located here. So the planum temporal is also it's located inside and it's responsible for lexicons and it stores lexicons. And then we have an area where there's two areas called the fusiform gyrus and also the occipital lobe. They interact and form the visual word form area, which is very, very significant to um, print sensitivity and learning how to see letters and words. And then we have the arcuate fasciculus, and we'll talk in detail about the arcuate fasciculus. And that uh, arcuate fascicula is, um, there are connective fibers, white matter connective fibers that connect. In this particular diagram, we're showing how it connects the, uh, it, the warnix area to the bronchus area, because these two connect and work together to perform uh, significant functions. Okay, And then, of course, we have the mid-temporal gyrus. And there's an area in the anterior part of the superior temporal gyrus. Remember I said that this is the temporal gyrus. And this is the occipital lobe. Okay? Now, I included handwriting, the excellent area, and also the area more so the occipital temporal area. Eczema is um, connected to language learning. Okay. Now, if we continue on, we will see that um, Brocker is also connected to other areas. Now, we can go back and look at Jean Piaget's work. In 1955, he said that a child's world is constructed through the sensory motor intelligences. And now we can say, um, we can look at James Guthrie and Guthrie's work in 2006. They said that letter processing automatically recruits the sensory motor brain network. Now this sensory motor brain net, uh, uh, network is associated with sensory motor intelligence that Piaget was speaking of. Continuing along the line of connectivity, we have the corpus calcium. And I mentioned the corpus calcium in previous slides. It's the area that connects the left and the right side of the brain, you know, left and right hemispheres. So uh, this is a healthy um, adult. And then we have um, a cross uh, sides of view, excuse me, of the same structure. And um, so we can see the shape of it uh, from two different angles. Now, the corpus calcium not only connects the uh, hemispheres, but it's also significant in higher cognitive processing, such as decoding of non-literal meaning, such as gestures and facial expressions. Now, furthermore, into the connective tissue, I mentioned the arcuate fasciculus, and we're looking again on the left uh, hemisphere. So we have a diffusion tensor image of the arcuate fasciculus here. And now we note that it transports information from one language area to the other, like I mentioned, with the Bronca area and the Warnix area. Now, it assembles meaningful strings, meaning that information such as printed letters and words, uh, letters are assembled together in the arcuate fasciculus. So now, it's responsible for the higher cognitive function, functions. It's very, very important. Connectivity and patterning. That's an um, area that I can talk about because it, is, it shows us how 
one area is connected to the other, but this type of branching that occurs as well. Um, each person has a different patterning or a different pattern of branching that occur due to experiences. And then we have that the expressive language processing occurs in the arcuate fasciculus as well. And we'll find that the BRCA area is associated with expressive language processing. Okay, now if we notice here that Montessori back in 1912 warned us and told us that to prepare teachers in the methods of experimental sciences is not going to be an easy matter. Today we can say something similar to that because we can say to prepare, uh, to prepare educators, not only teachers, but administrators and stakeholders that are interested in language learning and teaching children how to read. Okay, so we know that that is not going to be an easy matter, especially when we refer to neuroscience education. But just as we moved beyond Montessori's concerns, we will be able to move beyond the concerns that educators have today in regards to connecting neuroscience and education. Okay? Now, let's look at how we should go about making those connections in the future. Now, currently, the to do now, or the do now, is collecting knowledge related to neuroscience education. So as we continue to learn more and more about the areas of the brain and their functions and connections between function and areas, we will be able to move up to a place where there's a considerable amount of comprehension where educators, I am going to continue to say educators, who will begin to learn how to apply the neuroscience information and the, the knowledge that we're gaining today, and then we will get to a point where we can synthesize or we can uh, create lessons and also um, pedagogies. And then, as far as curriculum are concerned, we would still have to wait until we get to that point. We don't want to rush this because the theories are still being developed. Okay? Now that, I would consider, is the correct way. There's another way that where this is occurring, where neuroscience education is entering into the educational arena. Okay, right now we have commercial products that are entering in um, through not only through computer technology, but we have it to where um, teacher proof neuroscience curricula are being introduced into the schools, which I think we should be very, very careful of that because we have it to where if we just go ahead and introduce the neuroscience into the classroom without the adequate amount of knowledge and also um, the ability given teachers an opportunity to create a good pedagogy and then moving on to comprehension. It is at this stage where miseducation of teachers can occur and are occurring at this point because we have teachers who believe that they are uh, efficient in neural education due to the problem with commercial products. Now, then we need to look at John Dewey. John Dewey back in 1915, he said and he recognized that society must invest in the science of learning. This is very important because we know today that that is so. It is society that must invest, not through commercialism, but right into the schools. 
the teachers, the administrators. We have to invest in our educators in order to get a good understanding of the 21st century education. Now this is the end of the presentation today and what I would like to do is introduce the, you to the part two and I welcome you to learn about the sensory motor aspect of bringing neuroscience education into the classroom.